With millions of guns, Borderlands 2 gives you so many options for your loadout. But today, we look at the nuclear option and ask, can you beat Borderlands 2 with only the Nukem? I will briefly go over the rules. First off, we will be playing on UVHM OP10. If you're new to the game, that just means we're playing on the hardest difficulty and everything is 10 levels higher than us. Bar will not be allowed for the run, and the Nukem is the only gun I'm allowed to use, which means using a Logan's gun and a sham to absorb ammo is strictly off the table. In that case, you might be thinking I'm going to be using the big boom blaster to get ammo, but eh, wrong. If I want ammo, I'm going to have to find some or buy some. The only other unique pieces of gear I'm allowed to use are the legendary point in class mod for survivability and the Vault Hunter Relic, which doesn't help me combat wise at all and is mostly there as a placeholder. For our other two gear slots, we have a basic TDR shield and a low level grenade mod for slagging enemies. Anything non-unique is fair game, but I only use these for the challenge. This run will introduce two emergency crutch items. If I deem that the run requires them, I will use a stockpile relic and or a non-unique absorb shield. As for the build, I'll show it here. Since this challenge is all about nukes, I decided that Axton's nuke skill was allowed. I also skipped all the offensive turret skills because I pick up the turrets immediately after they release their nuclear explosions. If you want to call this challenge Borderlands with only nukes instead of only the nukem, that's fine by me. I just figured that this would be more interesting than throwing on a big boom blaster and having a field day. Now the turrets might be able to get some shots off before they get recalled, but these things don't really deal that much damage, so as long as they don't steal any major boss kills, I'll let a few shots slide. Now that we got the rules and build covered, let's hop into the run. Right off the bat, the good old gas mask curse kicks in, and we start out with two bully rots. Dealing with them wasn't necessarily hard, but these guys are so tanky that we ran out of ammo before we even made it to Tutorial Town. With all of Crazy Earl's ammo upgrades, the maximum amount of rockets you can hold is 33. Divide that by two and round up, we're left with 17 shots since the Nukem takes two ammo to fire. So with no ammo and no money to buy any more yet, we had to get creative. Cue the turret nukes. If we compare the Nukem nukes and the nuke skill nukes, we get a sentence with the word nuke in it too many times and also see that the nukes are very different. For example, the turrets deal a lot less damage, but they also light the enemies on fire. The Nukem's projectiles just deal damage while the turret's explosion has some very strong knockback properties. Returning viewers know I love those. And the turret nukes are also pretty much infinite, but they lose their value past generic mobs, since the cooldown of our action skill is too slow to outdamage the health regen of most bad guys in UVHM. But here in Tutorial Town, everyone is soft. Soft enough to kill with a little grape juice and two turret chucks. After Hemilock got the power back on, we were able to buy a little bit of ammo and set off to clear the way to Boom Boom. That ammo was specifically used for the ironclad lads, because the turret nukes were too weak for them. A little bit of patience and careful planning and we were able to finish the mobs off. So as we were steps away from fighting Boom Boom, we were once again broke and lacking the proper ammo to take on this fight. So I did what anyone would do when they're strapped for cash. Go to the beach and look for treasure chests. Here I would farm up until I hit the money cap and also fill my inventory with items so I had extra items to sell for when I ran out. Anyway, loaded up and ready to go, we start the Boom Boom fight. After I lured Boom to the back alley and mugged him at portable nuclear warhead launcher point, we made our first attempt at killing Boom. Testing the likely highly irradiated waters of this fight, we find that it was going to be a very close fight, even with full ammo. After a practically perfect attempt with lining up kill skill combos, slag, and making sure I fire all my nukes quickly, I was still coming up short. So this fight was undoable, which means no. You can't be, but wait, 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 did you guys see that? Reroll the footage, hold on. You see it now? The run is saved, all thanks to this do cut. In Borderlands 2, when you pick up a gun or grenade mod, it gives you some ammo of the weapon type you just picked up. So when I opened up this porta potty and seen this long brown log looking thing, I was filled with joy. So on our next attempt, we made sure to set up everything perfectly, grab the launcher for the ammo, and managed to just barely kick him out of his turret. The moment of truth was when I ran back to fill my ammo, not knowing if he would just hop back into his booster seat. But lucky for us, he doesn't get back in unless you die, so we managed to finish him off for good. After clearing out all the mandatory bad guys on the way up to our boat, we start our fight with Flint. My plan was to just fight him from down here, but I forgot that my turrets had knocked back for a second and I ended up launching him out of his arena, which bugged out his AI. Again? But it looked like this was going to be necessary to cheese him like this anyway. 
While lobbing these nukes, I was slowly realizing that I wasn't going to have enough money to keep buying the ammo I would need to take him down. So after round two of farming the money, we knocked Flint off again and spent like 10 minutes trying to get him into a good spot closer to the ammo vendor. Slide to the left. By now you've probably seen that the nukes we're firing don't go very far. That's because this thing is nothing but Torg parts, so firing at anything while below eye level likely means I'm getting a dose of the radiation too. Anyway, after lobbing 61 nukes down at Captain Lead here, he finally died. Arriving at Three Horns, I used my Bullymong whispering skills to coerce, I mean, convince the Bullymongs into fighting the local bandits while I decked out my new ride. I didn't know the blue steel skin was a Torg skin, so I was pretty hyped to show up to Sanctuary with style. Door guy thought it was cringe though, so I decided to give him the good old one too, or as I like to call it, the deuce nuke him. Anyway, Corporal Reese needed our help. Uh, excuse me. Should I leave that in the video? Eh, screw it. Long story short, I learned a little something about collateral damage. To make up for my friendly fire shenanigans, I made sure to kill the 20 bandits in his honor. I mean, I shot a nuke into their camp, and realistically, there's no surviving that, so I'm pretty sure I killed more than 20. After making it to Sanctuary to realize that all the important people that we were supposed to meet there weren't even there, we set off to Frostburn Canyon to meet the least important person there is. Blowing up the Psychos here was pretty easy with my noob tube launcher, right up until they class swapped into Black Ops 1 flak jacket builds. Joke's on them though, because they can't have flak jacket and lightweight pro, so using gravity against these guys made it child's play. We also dropped the nuclear stinky on the big psychos because I didn't feel like taking another loan out to pay for the ammo costs. Here we took our first death after running out of grape flavored grenades, but I didn't let that stop my gamer momentum and I was still bodying these bandits. Oh! This momentum carried on to our next task of upgrading our car to get into the Bloodshot Dam. Vehicles in this game aren't balanced properly for OP-10, so they actually get easier to kill as you increase your OP level. So for a brief period in time, I got to feel like Duke Nukem himself by sending body parts and car chunks across the horizon. This was honestly therapeutic, and in my masochistic profession, you learn to milk the good times. So I destroyed a few more cars, bodied this tubby spider ant, and even took on the caravan just for the heck of it. I was going to ride the caravan back to Ellie's before this spider ant ruined everything, and I discovered some goofy stuff with the nuke turrets. I managed to hitch a ride on the back and experience the first ever Borderlands 2 cliche car chase mission, and honestly felt pretty cool doing so. After pulling a prank on myself, I decided that I wanted to destroy the caravan, so I set up a roadblock and blew the thing straight off the cliff, finding one more reason why nuke turret wasn't as bad as I thought it was. Anyway. Badma was our next target, and I wanted to get rid of him as quickly as possible. Wanna meet my girlfriend? Yeah, haters are gonna be like, that wasn't a nuke, Brendan Fall- or, or whatever eight-year-olds like to say nowadays, but let's be honest, I was going to put the stinky on Badma anyway. After reloading the map to grab the key, we decided that we were going to need some more money in order to get through the Bloodshot Dam. After we filled up, we started clearing out the Bloodshots. I'll take this time to talk about some of the strats I've developed so far. First off, Smart Ammo Purchases. Each set of rockets bought gives you 12 rockets, so if you were to buy 3, that would get you 36. But since our max ammo is 33, that third purchase is kind of a ripoff, so to conserve our well-earned funds, I would only buy two at a time or make sure I was actually getting my 12 rockets per purchase. It might mean more trips to the vendor, but it also means less trips to Wham Bam Island, and there was already a lot of those in this run. As for actual combat, I found that swapping weapons is way faster than reloading, so in many situations, I'd use my eight shots, retreat to reload, and run back in to deal some more damage again. Anyway, let's talk about Mad Mike in his toilet room. You guys know the drill here. Enemies with the high ground, cowardice, marauders, all that jazz. The high ground proved to be especially tough during this fight since my nukes turn into boomerangs if I look too high up. Despite the hardships, I just made sure to play patiently and utilize the knockback of the nuke turrets to their fullest. What the angry Michael doing? Oh! The next fight, however, will be the hardest one yet. The warden posed an actual threat here. With no ammo vendor nearby, I wasn't sure if we were going to have enough firepower to destroy the warden before he flew off and took Roland to the Friendship Gulag. So I had to make sure not to use any of our ammo on the mobs along the way, which resulted in a few of our untimely demises. 
We made our one and only attempt at Warden with high hopes and- Ah, oh God, bro, is that three angelic guards? Okay, man, whatever. Everything was going well, right up until the point it ran out of ammo. Grit, also known as the only thing keeping us alive, had an absolute field day with my health bar here to try and save the day, but I just couldn't find any more rockets lying around. And add insult to injury, these angelic guards were spawn camping the hell out of me, so all I could do was wait there and suffer until the warden took off with Roland. Before we went to that dreaded place, we had to go farm up some more money to make this fight work. Here at the Gulag, the fight is usually a bit harder because now the Warden gets the ability to moonshot even more reinforcements in, as if three angelic guards wasn't enough. In order to nuke this toaster, we were going to have to use the good old vendor milking strat to get this fight done. It was hard to tell exactly how many nukes it took to kill Warden because I had to get like four second wins during the fight, but I counted at least 37 shots to destroy the Warden. After dealing with the rest of the loaders with Roland, it was time to meet up with Mardo and Tina and blow up a train. I used the nuke turret's fire dot to light the Varkids on fire and felt way smarter than I should have for it. And then I had to help Tina get some bombs, even though there's literally an ammo vendor in her workshop. And also, I'm literally holding a nukem. I feel like I could have just shot the train, but oh well. So we start our fight with Wilhelm, and uh, we ran into a very small issue. So I get his health down to here by the time my rocket ammo got down to here. And the ammo vendor was at the beginning of the map, which also required a grenade jump to get to. This long run to the vendor also gave Wilhelm plenty of time to recharge his shields. Luckily, the shields are pretty weak, and the shield surveyors also just kind of explode from the Nukem's blast radius. Uh, join the club, I guess. Anyway, it took two trips to the vendor and a total of 38 nukes to take Wilhelm down. Side note, since this vendor strat is going to be used very often during this run, I've decided to save myself the time and just call this strat spud running, because the Nukem is kind of just a souped up potato gun if you think about it. Back at Sanctuary, I kind of accidentally the whole shield system and we had to evacuate the city. Like literally, the whole city had to leave. And I seed my opportunity to pull an assassination attempt on Lilith. Which backfired. Not my proudest moment. Anyway, it was time to run through Ohio, or wait, I mean the fridge, sorry. This would have probably went terribly if it wasn't for Grit, but then again, you could probably say that for the entire challenge. Our next obstacle was the big old beacon eating spaghetti squid. This guy gave me quite a bit of issues. Here's a list. One, he has random shield regen, which means more rockets eaten up. Two, the loader's moonshot in to deal with the Thresher, just try and murder me instead. Three, every time the Thresher tunnels underground, it removes the slag effect from him. Four, the ammo vendor was like a mile away, not to mention the way back. And number five, the Thresher would wait for me right at this door and snipe me with its instant health gate needle attack. Woohoo. Anyway, it took like an hour to finally get this guy to die since I needed to go farm more money. When I went to grab the beacon, this happened. Oh, game, don't fucking crap. Yeah, so another farming trip and another hour and a half later, we got him again, and we could finally go defend Overlook by dropping multiple nuclear bombs there. I didn't have high expectations for this fight, but to my own surprise, I was surviving and killing off all the loaders pretty well. I mean, the beacon got bodied like every 10 seconds and it eventually went invincible, but I was on track to surviving all the way up until the fast travel showed up, which I did technically do. Anyway, compared to the rough rest of this run, that was a major dub in my book. The preserve and the big bird were up next. And after a little preparation, we jumped in and started making our way through the bad guys. Wounding the loaders went fine since wounding one loader at a time is super hard. Nukes aren't really the assassin's weapon of choice. Uh. Remember, I learned that the hard way. Anyway, after taking half an hour to kill Pomona and Toomba for literally no reason and needing to refarm ammo again because of it, we pushed through and very slowly used spud running strats to handle all the mandatory mobbing before our 1v4 with the loot. Aw, oh, fuck, I forgot doctor's orders. Jeez, man, I'm really dropping the ball, aren't I? Long story short, I decided to keep trucking towards Bloodwing, and then right before the fight, our homie Tom, you might recognize him from the co-op challenges we do, used his Twitch channel points to redeem Turn On Phys X, which is a Borderlands graphic setting that makes cool puddles of elements and stuff, but also makes your game crash from slag particles, especially during the Bloodwing cutscene. But we didn't realize in order for Phys X to be enabled, we would have to completely restart the game. 
Tom agreed that I could just turn it on after the fight, but he was also all like, I suppose, and I already felt bad for missing doctor's orders, and uh, I had to do it, I had to do it. So we restart the preserve, this time with doctor's orders and with Fezex on, with the agreement that it would stay on until the game crashed at least once. After refarming and remobbing, we killed the loot dudes and got one of the grenade mods of all time. After that, we made our way to our first attempt on Bloodwing. The strat for this fight was a bit different since there are no vendors we can run to, so we had to make sure to wait for her to land so we could get slag and utilize our two free nukes from the turret. The fight was going good, right up until the very end. Hmm, maybe. The slag's kicking. Oh my god! I was so close to taking this dub, but the game winning rocket was a complete whiff of a shot. What could have been a spectacular ending set off a chain of events that really messed me up. Turrets, don't take my kill, that'd be cringe. Turrets, don't take my kill, that'd be cringe. I'm the train, Dot. Was she really that close? That's cringe. Preserve round three, here we go! Oh. Okay, real talk. Attempt three is when this run started to get really cursed. For example, this clip. Right off the bat, let's go. Oh! Oh, what the f No way! This attempt ended better, but it was a nuke from the turret that got her, and that was so freaking unsatisfying. But oh well, we had to continue. To round four, the preserve. No, don't fucking steal my kill. Don't steal my kill turret. Round five of the preserve really started to break me. Fun fact, if you save quit during the Bloodwing fight and retry it later, Mordecai just stops helping you, so I had to slag the skags if I wanted to survive, but also resource manage my grenades so I had enough for Big Bird over here. I was in the preserve for five and a half hours in total before I finally got over my skill issues and nuked this friggin bird. The rivalry score between us prior to this run was 5-3 and I'm not really sure who to give this point to. On one hand, I technically killed her first try and on the other hand, I was here for almost six hours so uh, let's just give the point to the turret this time. The next homie we had to recruit was Brick. In order to recruit Brick, we had to get recruited by Brick. I knew that dropping into this fight that I was going to run out of ammo eventually, so I decided to recruit some of his recruits. Jeez, man, what kind of pyramid scheme is this? Yeah, I took this opportunity to take a break. I got back and I don't think the Goliaths killed like anything, so I just started nuking everyone. I was also making sure to get as many bandits in the blast radius as possible to conserve ammo. Fun fact, 1v1ing a scavenger is pretty tough when you have no ammo. I searched the whole place looking for more rockets and found some in a trash can, but I still had like three waves to go after that scavenger. I was able to use nuke turrets for the little guys, but the buff boys proved to be a little bit tougher, so I ended up dying and just buying ammo on my way back in. After a solid 10 minutes of ammo conservation and whatever the heck this is, we managed to barely kill the last goliath with a couple of nuke turrets. I wanted to launch the sarcastic slab off a cliff, but homie just straight up ignored the nuke turret's knockback, so I went to get ammo so I could just trick shot him or something, but straight up forgot he existed apparently, and just started going after loaders with Brick. It was kinda nice to just play the support role for once, especially since Brick is a master at the craft. Get him, Brick! Yeah! We also had to fight three ultimate loaders, which was a big bite out of my wallet, so it was back to wham bam to prep for the next few fights. Up next was the jack double assassination job. Like most of my assassinations so far, I thought everything was going to work before something bad happened. This little rat straight up booked it as soon as I went down. You guys are like, silly gas mask, that's not a rat, that's a human. Well, I got news for you. God. Hold up. Wait, what? Who just heard a rat? This game is so cursed, bro. If I wasn't killing this double, I would be pointing him towards the nearest exorcist because he's got some demons inside him. As per usual, I died to the double, and when I came back, he just stood still for me. No idea why this happens, but it's not my fault the game is like this, so I took it and ran. Now that we had all the pieces required for the bunker raid, we started our climb up the mountain. Obstacle one was this constructor right here. 
We've dealt with these toasters before, but this one kind of makes things up for us, which is a very Blender-like thing for a toaster to do, if you ask me. But the issue was Spud running wasn't going to be an option, since he despawns if you get too far away. Step 1 to winning this fight was reloading the map until I got lucky enough to fight one that's level 89. This would save ourselves some time and ammo. And step 2 was to hide while slowly whittling down its health with nuke turrets. I could only land one at a time because if I got too close I was toast. So after hiding under these stairs for 20 minutes we finally took the first obstacle down. Obstacle 2 were these demonic heathens. If you didn't know this already, these guys are bugged and just completely immune to splash damages so no grenades no rockets, and most notably, no nukes. So at this point in the run, you could argue two things. One, the nukem can't do it, the run is busted. Or two, this is a glitch, so therefore it should not count. If you ask my opinion, I'm on the ladder. Not, not literally on a ladder, I'm actually just cowering behind a few boxes here in this clip, but you know what I mean. I think glitches like these shouldn't invalidate the run, but if you think otherwise, that's just your opinion and I respect how wrong it is. Anyway, we had to progress, so let's just kill him with our own turrets. They actually take nuke turret damage? Why do they take nuke turret damage? Okay, so for once this cursed confusing game is on our side, let's go. Okay, I know these turrets aren't nukem shots. I realize saying that out loud it sounds like common sense, but I already know if I didn't, someone in the comment section would tell me as if I'm some bozo who didn't realize. Like I said before, if you want to call this challenge BL2 with only nukes instead of with only the nukem, that works for me. Especially because our next obstacle introduces another type of nuke that'll help us get to the bunker. So the super toaster has nukes of its own. And I didn't learn until recently that the toaster can hurt itself with these nukes. Meaning I could T-pose here all day and just wait for the thing to die on its own if I really wanted to. Quick shout out to SpuddyCube for showing me this strat. He does challenge runs over on his channel too, so I'll have him linked in the description. I would definitely go check him out. Thanks to him, this also means one of my old challenges is no longer a failure. I won't spoil which one if you're new here. Speaking of new here, if you made it this far into the video, you're probably enjoying the content, and in that case, you might as well subscribe and check out my other runs while you're at it. I would appreciate it greatly and would love to have you in the gas mask gang. Anyway, we used the same strat as the last toaster, but this time it only took 15 minutes, probably because I was able to use both turrets to damage it and also the whole nuking itself thing. The final obstacle before the bunker fight. Face McShooty. Oh, I forgot it arcs. Um, in that case, maybe we gotta do one of these. 45 degree angle up. Hmm, maybe, maybe we need a little bit more arc. Yeah, so our Nukems didn't have enough rocket speed, so I tried with a full Mollywan part of Nukem to see if hitting him from this distance was even possible. And well, it kinda exceeded expectations. Sadly, we cannot shoot Face McShooty in the face, but we can make all of his skin fall off if we have the right parts on our launcher. It was finally time for the big bunker fight. I could describe fighting the big turrets as straightforward, uncomplicated, self-explanatory, etc. But when it comes to the bunker fight, the only words that come to mind are nothing but net? Yeah, the bunker's hurt boxes are friggin' weird, man. To help you guys better understand his hurt boxes, I ripped this diagram out of the game files to show you exactly what's going on. Here you can see that in order to hit the bunker, we kinda have to aim for its butt. I, I mean, I think that's its butt, I don't know. Ever since I heard Oboe Shoes call this guy a Crunchwrap Supreme, I just get hungry every time I see him, so I might not be the best person to ask about robotic anatomy. Anyway, so began the two hour fight with the bunker. After our first heartbreaking death, I developed a strategy. Step one was to chill until he did his flexing pose, I like to call it. He doesn't move at all in this position, which helps when trying to hit his invisible hurt boxes. Step two was getting the proper setup in the form of slag and kill skills. The slagging part was simple, I just threw a grenade at him, and the kill skills were gotten using a cool Axton tech. If you throw your second turret and recall the first one before it lands, the game gets confused and triggers your kill skills, which in our case gave us some more fire rate and gun damage. And step three was to repeat and just make sure I was being smart about my ammo purchases. At first the only thing I had to worry about was some loaders sneaking down and putting the stinky on me or something. But after half the bunker's health is gone, he starts using his giant slag laser, which made it harder to actually get to him. 
Instead of having two safe spots where I could deal damage during his flex pose, I only had one now because I needed this weird set of party glasses to protect me. While we waited, chat started bringing up cursed Borderlands enemy crossbreed ideas like angelic jet loaders, so I at least had something to talk about while we waited two hours in order to progress. We eventually got through the whole fight and destroyed the bunker for good. All it took was two hours and 109 nukes. While sorting all the loot to sell for more rocket ammo, I noticed something a bit odd. Oh, okay. Dude, I seen the little Molly one tip. I was like, if I get a motherfucking 94 sham in the run where I'm not allowed to use it, but it would be the best fucking thing ever, I was gonna fucking. The game was really tempting me. And I mean, like, really tempting me, because it knew what we were going to have to do next. That being. Angel Core. Let's do some math real quick. Multiple waves of loaders, including Angelic Guards, plus there's no vendor to buy ammo, plus if you leave or save quit, you reset the whole Angel Core fight, equals quite the predicament. I tried the fight and ran out of ammo pretty quick, and I waited around for like an hour hoping Angel Core would drop some rocket ammo, and at first I wasn't sure if it was possible to get more ammo. So with most of our hope lost, we started looking for answers. On a separate save, we tried testing absorbing super loader rockets for ammo. Yes, this would require the absorb shield crutch item, but I wasn't sure what to do otherwise. It didn't work anyway, but the crutch items would get us through Angel Core faster. Also while testing, we found that one enemy crossbreed chat was talking about. Actually, let's test your volley. Oh, you Somebody clip that. I know that Angelic Guard didn't just fucking fly. I know that Angelic Guard didn't just fucking fly. Can somebody clip that? Was that not just a jet loader? Who was fucking joking about the flying Angelic Guard earlier? Who was it? Which one of you motherfuckers was it? It's not funny because now it exists. Anyway, it was confirmed by Dark Smoke 11 that you can, in fact, get rocket ammo in Angel Core. So I had two options. I could suffer through it without the crutch items, or I could use them and get through the core faster. And oh boy, did I have a decision to make. After the testing, I ended the stream and took a few days off. I went to my hometown, visited friends. I even drank a monster, normally for once. It was nice living life so calmly. I learned that not everything has to be balls to the wall all the time. It's okay to take the easy route and enjoy the ride sometimes. But this was not one of those times. Do you know what this is? It's an original monster salt. They don't make these anymore, and it's my favorite flavor of anything ever to exist. I've only got 21 left before I'm out for good for life. To make sure I spread these out and don't burn through them, I said I get one for every challenge run I beat. Now, do you think I want to sit there after the run, sipping my assault, thinking to myself, did I really earn this? Hell no. Do you think that monster would taste its absolute best with that question swimming around in my head? Hell no. Do you think I'm going to take the easy way out? Say it with me this time. Hell no. I returned from my trip, and I rode the elevator down to Angel Core. Not with dread. Not with anguish. But with pure determination to get through this Angel Core without any unneeded aid. During the fight, I made sure to group up all the enemies to get the most out of each shot. Ion loaders were especially useful for once because they call all the loaders into one spot. But even with maximizing our damage per rocket, we ran out a few rounds in and the waiting game began. I was able to slowly kill some enemies with slag and nuke turrets, but with the long cooldown, 95% of the damage I dealt was healed by the time I could throw more. On average, I was getting rocket ammo every 15 minutes, and each drop gives you four shots, which would allow me to kill about one angelic guards, assuming I didn't waste the ammo on failed kills. At some points in this, I was super helpless because I had three loaders and three laser turrets focused on me while I was trying to rush the ammo drops. So the death counter got a huge increase here. There was some hope along the way in the form of Roland and his turret. He was actually killing some of the loaders, but this help was short-lived when Lilith showed up. 
Don't get me wrong, with how dumb this situation is, I would take all the help I could get. But Lilith was literally doing no damage, woohoo. I got so excited every time I found a rocket ammo. It meant I was one step closer to getting away from Lilith and her aggressive cowboyism. I was down in this place for three straight hours, not to mention the hour of testing I did days prior. And would you guys believe me if I told you this wasn't even the worst part of the run yet? Up next was Sawtooth Cauldron. The ambush commanders here ate up a lot of ammo per kill, so I decided to launch them into the lava. Every time I have tried this strat in the past, they end up just slowly floating up and out of bounds because this game is cursed, but flying didn't save them this time. Flying away definitely helped the next set of bad guys we had to deal with though. The lack of range with the rockets really came into play here. On top of them being hard to hit, it would take at least two shots with slag, and that's if I can hit them consecutively. Otherwise, they just fly away and get all their health back. With one exception of the level 89 buzzard, who would only require one nuke while slagged. So now it was time to farm weak enemy RNG again. This was actually pretty simple since all you had to do to reset their level was jump back down the elevator shaft and just ride it back up. Even with this strat, it took upwards of an hour and a half to kill them all. I partially blame this uncontrollable Goliath who put the stinky on everything it saw, including me. I mean, it's respectable as hell, but not something I want to be on the receiving end of. Anyway, you might want to remember this math for later. Why will we need it for later? Well, I decided that I'm going to tackle both the Torg DLCs for the bonus content in this run, so stick around for that. Fun. Anyway, we stole all the explosives, which again, I have literal nukes, not sure why we needed these, and then hitched a ride on one of the buzzards all the way to the boneyard. Which, hold on, why didn't they just fly us over the bridge? Dude, these friggin' plot holes, man. After another money farming run, we hit all the pumping stations. Some went smoothly, others didn't. But in the end, we were able to hit the pipe with our car and managed to even fit the entire bandit technical inside. Now, I'm not really sure why, but I decided to kill Saturn on this run. Long story short, Saturn is a cheater. During multiple attempts, he would just disappear when he was almost dead. I found out that if the junk loaders respawned, that is what triggers him disappearing. It's like Hyperion was just like, this thing's almost broken, let's just scrap it, turn it to a bunch of junk loaders. Yeah, so I had to modify our spud running strats in order to kill Saturn fast enough. I threw the whole smart ammo purchases thing out the window and just full bot. We were spending too much time running back and forth and not enough time shooting potatoes, so this strat actually helped. Altogether, the winning kill took 164 nukes. Makes me wonder what would happen if we sent that many to the actual planet. To the scientists watching, feel free to teach me in the comment section. Anyway, we got the info we needed and set off to our last few fights. The Claptrap door wasn't prepared for our spud running strats, well, actually, it kind of was because running too far away makes the turrets respawn and now they're hostile again, so yeah, that sucked. But overall, the door wasn't too bad. Heroes Pass has no mandatory combat, so a couple of skips got us through here. And now we could finally fight Jack and the Warrior. I was honestly worried about both of these fights, but let's talk about Jack first. Destroying his shield was the first challenge. His health bar has like crazy regen, but his shield doesn't regen unless you just stop damaging him for like 10 minutes. Knowing this, I decided to use the nuke turrets on his shield to save the rockets for his health bar. My first attempt at fighting him without blocking him at the terminal turned out to be very bad, slag being very hard to apply to Jack, and the shield surveyor he spawns making him immune to my nukes makes this fight super tough. Even with the blocking him at the terminal strat, nuking someone that you're practically hugging isn't the smartest thing to do so this strat wasn't very foolproof. During a failed attempt at blocking him, I found out that he is very easy to slag while he has this bubble up for some reason, and I just kind of took the chance. Okay, everyone slag. Oh, let's fucking go! Yeah, so after an hour 40 of trying to kill him, I got the right setup of slag, kill skills, and the damage boost from last ditch effort to kick in to finally take him down. The final fight of the main game was here, and the warrior was going to be rough. I made a legit attempt at fighting him and realized that 17 shots barely dented his health, so I accepted that I was going to have to cheese this guy. I had two options to do so. First off, the super safe but probably very long process of waiting for ammo drops here where he can't hit me or the quicker and riskier strat of jumping up to this spot and spud running the warrior to death. The latter being the one that gets this video out faster. 
Again, not actually on a ladder. I'm more role playing a volleyball for the warrior in this clip, but you know what I mean. So after practicing this jump and refarming for the fight, we start the slow process of killing the warrior. Attempt number one ended in tragedy when I got distracted and jumped into the arena. I tried to grenade jump back out, which is possible, but I didn't figure it out in time, so there went an hour of progress. Altogether, I was fighting him for three and a half hours. Two hours of that was just the final attempt. And altogether, it took 195 nukes to take him down. With the last rocket in our possession, we finished this challenge. Which means, you can beat Borderlands 2 with only the nukem. As promised before, the run is not yet complete. We're going to do a couple of DLCs, starting with the Waddle Gobbler DLC. We got here and Torg immediately turned some dude into a puddle. After that, he then proceeded to tell us we need to poison the Waddle Gobbler in order to kill it. And so we started blowing up the kitchen. We even styled on this Gordon Ramsay guy by putting the stinky on him with a meat grinder. After that, we went to the meat locker and blew up some pirates. Before you ask, yes, we're still in the same DLC. The last thing we needed was some poison, but in order to get to the Jabbers, we had to fight this clown shoot floaty dude that just reminds me of Sora from Smash Bros, and that just made me angry. The Jabbers up ahead were a bit challenging, mainly because they needed to be slagged in order for them to drop a gland, and the hallucinogenic poison didn't help my grenade aim either. After a bit, I realized I have blast radius. I don't need to hit these guys directly, so I just martyr styled the last one and started cooking. These kitchen crusaders did not want to let me cook but my Nukem had something to say about that. Anyway, after stuffing myself full of money, I started my first attempt, and my ammo got me about this far. And since we don't have any access to vendors here, we were going to have to use some turret nukes to take the Waddle Gobbler down. I was kind of worried that all these tribute dudes would target me, but the Baby Gobblers took their full attention while the big one targeted nothing but me. Attempt number two ended in turret gun kill cringe, but attempt number three ended with a bang. So yes, you can beat the horrible hunger of the ravenous Waddle Gobbler with only the Nukem. After relaxing with Grandma Torg a bit, we headed towards the Campaign of Carnage. Well, actually, I wanted to see if the Nukem could farm a Nukem really quick. And lucky me, she spawned first try and she also dropped it on run number one, so that was cool. Anyway, the Campaign of Carnage. Right after this money, this DLC jumps right into the action as we have a small trick shotting se I mean, mobbing section before the game introduces the coward. Yeah, screw this guy. At this point, he was our sponsor, I guess, and set us up with our first fight in the arena. At first, I thought this fight was going to have a timer on it, but we lucked out and there wasn't, so as long as we didn't die, which we did, we would be fine. Our second try, I decided to get as many nuke turret kills as I could so I could save ammo for the arena goliath. Spud running wasn't an option here, so I was hoping to maybe find some launcher drops on the ground, but that's not exactly what happened. Oh no, there's another wave! Yeah, that was my first ever Cobra drop. It feels kind of wild that I found one during a goofy challenge run like this. I wanted to do a Cobra run eventually and call it an excuse to farm a Cobra at the end of it, but now it's not really an excuse anymore, so now I gotta get another Cobra eventually. Anyway, I literally failed my only job when I forgot to wear my gas mask like an idiot when the coward filled the arena with Armstrong gas, so big oops on my part. With our sponsor now being our enemy, we had to get a new one, and Torg knew exactly where to find one. During this challenge fight, we only had to kill off the buff dudes, which we had enough ammo to do so, so this part was actually pretty simple. Then we jump into the Pyro P fight, which shouldn't be anything too hard. Sure, we will probably run out of ammo, but we can just use our nuke turret- Oh, what is that? Okay, real talk guys. This fight is super dumb because of this health regen. If we break his shield before using any of our rockets, full ammo will maybe take 40% of his health away. And if we want more ammo, we have to use these two respawnable crates and get lucky. But even with extreme luck and getting one drop each, that only gives us 16 rockets, which would get him down to 40% health maybe. And since these crates have a timer on them, we still wouldn't have enough ammo. Even if we got a double drop and then immediately reopened them and got another double drop of ammo, it still wouldn't be enough. And to make matters worse, the game started tempting me again by giving me another Logan's gun and sham during a money farm for this fight. A homie by the name of Stormin said they would give me $200 if I managed to kill Pete that day, but I didn't want the allure of money to stop me from testing every possible strategy before I used a crutch item. So I had to get creative. 
If we grenade jump out of this arena, we could trigger the Moxie cutscene before we even kill Pete. This, however, doesn't help us since the Pyro Pete objective remains. Moxie wasn't the reason we came up here though. We came up here for these two red chests. If we get a rocket launcher in one of these, and or this porta potty I found out here, we might have enough ammo to kill Pete. But for the life of me, I could not find a launcher chest with launcher ammo in it. I did the math and even with 4 ammo drops from the respawnable crates and 3 launchers assuming we got one out of each red chest and the porta potty, we would have enough ammo to kill him. But we need the grenade jump up there, run to the back room, etc. Which gives him plenty enough time to out heal our DPS. I was straight up out of ideas, so I had to use the stockpile relic. With 64 rockets, we were sitting at practically double our old ammo capacity. A couple attempts with this strat and we managed to kill Pyro Pete with our last rocket. The worst part about this is that Stormin was a freaking liar. They didn't give me $200. They gave me $300. Okay, jokes aside. The real worst part about this is when I found this after the fight. So, with this knowledge, I think this fight is possible without the stockpile relic. You just need to make an attempt and then open these chests when you're empty on ammo. Then pray for rocket launchers, I guess. If you're lucky enough and fast enough, I think this is possible. I made a few attempts like this, but with my hard drive running out of room for footage and some other fights coming up, I made the call to just put a bounty on this fight. The first person to show me that they can do this will get $20 on Steam. I'll have specific rules and the save file in the description for you, but I just want to see if someone with this build, this gear, and no stockpile relic can do this fight. If anyone beats it, I'll have a pinned comment letting everybody know, so make sure to check that first. Anyway, let's move on. We met Tina and blew up some heathenistic cookies as a training segment, and after that we did Death Race to get the attention of Motor Mama. Motor Mama didn't have health regen because, well... I'm not really sure actually, it's kinda weird who they do and don't throw the health regen at honestly. Anyway, we blew up her ride and started phase 2 of the fight where we had to simultaneously dodge rockets and make sure her shield didn't recharge. Ammo wasn't too much of an issue since we were practically hugging a vendor the entire time, and after a while she eventually kicked the bucket. We now had the number 3 ranking and needed to go after Flyboy for the second place spot. So we headed towards the forge. We all think dunking on Sawtooth Cauldron is fun and funny, whatever. But after this run, I don't think I'm going to be able to come back to this map and not relive trauma. Let's talk about these buzzards I gotta kill first. Now, I usually wouldn't have to kill the cargo ones, but the Nukem can't break these wooden boxes for some reason, so the only way to get them is to just destroy the whole buzzard. And these guys are also way tankier than the normal buzzards, so that's neat. I've blown up buzzards before, so this should be doable, right? No. Yeah, remember that math I was talking about earlier? Yeah, you guys can see why this isn't gonna work. So after many, many tries, we had to mix things up. So I figured it was time to switch up the Nukem. I wasn't going to use the full Molly one Nukem from Face McShooty because all I needed was to switch from damage prefix to rocket speed prefix, and I was able to do this fight. And after only three hours, we were able to progress. And there goes Stormin again. Okay, well in that case, just like Pete, I'll have a bounty on this fight if you can do it without the rocket speed newcoms. 20 bucks on Steam to the first person that can show me they did it. Save file and rules in the description. Anyway, let's get this part over with. <sighs> the coward and his stupid blimp are truly something I do not wish upon anybody. Well, okay, well, maybe Lilith, but that's besides the point. Literally everything that could go wrong in this fight did, and with great intensity. I can just barely hit him with the limp shot nukem if he flies over the arena, and I'm on the highest part of it. And on top of that, the damage I deal is quite negligible. Like it would take multiple nukes to see his shield or health bar even move. At first I thought I could just play smart and, you know, hide until he flies over and just slowly kill him. And by slowly, I mean very slowly since the ammo vendor was a mile and a tower climb away. If I played well and didn't nuke myself by whiffing a completely vertical shot, I could destroy his shield in two hours. But that's where the real kicker comes in. He summons four buzzards to help him. 
which fighting four buzzers with the limp shot Nukem and not dying proved to be extremely hard. Now I could have used these turrets up here, but that didn't feel very right. And I could also land a few nuke turrets if he flew past certain spots on the map, but the damage was so minimal it might as well have been nothing. I had a multiple, three hour attempts, just fail because of death. I had to wait so long just for him to even be close enough to hit. I fucking loathed this fight. After some testing, I thought the buzzards didn't respawn after they died, making this possible, and that gave me some hope. I'm gonna be honest guys, I kinda have newfound hope now. I am once again hopeful, knowing this. Two seconds later. The new plan was to take out the buzzards and not care about dying, since the buzzards wouldn't come back. And well, I was kinda rolling these guys and felt good doing it. That excitement was quickly destroyed when I came to find out they did in fact respawn after 20 minutes, so I went back to not knowing what to do. Oh yeah, did I mention the fact that his health bar has a 80% damage reduction to explosives? Because his health bar has an 80% damage reduction to explosives. Honestly, I'm too mad about this fight to make a Led Zeppelin joke, so you're gonna have to fill that one in yourself. <laughs> Guys. <laughs> Guys. I fought this thing for 20 hours. Nearly a full day. Three days of testing and attempts with no progress whatsoever. I really wanted to find a way to kill this thing with the derp nukem, but it just wasn't happening. From here, I had two options. Camp here and wait five minutes in between laps just to kill him with nuke turrets after another 20 hours or use the rocket speed nukem and kill it from the safety of this cave spot right here, completely avoiding the buzzards. The latter, well this time I'm actually on one, was the way to go. Day four of Zeppelin was upon us, and I came ready. I brought a monster to get me through this fight. And then a Twitch viewer named Stinky on him redeemed mask up, making me wear the mask until my current objective is done, so no monster for me. I grabbed all the high priced legendary items we found throughout our 31 farms so far and started what I hoped was my final attempt. Four and a half hours. Four and a half hours of stress upon my shoulders, of shooting the coward blimp and dodging its rockets before I decided that this was now personal. I sold almost all the legendaries I had left so failure would mean further attempts likely would require more legendaries to be sold. Legendaries that I would have to farm, but I didn't let that stop me from finishing the blimp off the right way with the derp nukem. I filled my pockets with rockets and started climbing up the tower, or I guess the stairway to heaven, there's that joke. I went down twice on the way up, likely making my next bleed out very short. I made it to the top and rushed to the highest building and took cover, waiting for Piston to fly by. I can still hear the buzzards flying around me, circling, waiting for their chance to destroy what sanity I have left. They haunt me to this very day. I wasn't even gonna bother with slag or turret kill skills just in the off chance that they stole my satisfaction of a nukem kill from me. My heart was racing. You guys can't blame the monster because remember, I didn't even get to drink one. The pressure was at its max, and I had to finish this fight. Get nay nay. I put the stinky on him. Well, let's fucking go, Starman. You did great. Let's fucking go. Now get back here and we'll see about finishing the piston. Can someone please tell me in what world does it take 378 nuclear bombs to pop a fucking balloon? I can easily say this fight was the worst fight in Gas Mask Challenge Run history. Honestly. This was the true final boss of the run, and I'm going to be a bit bold here with one last bounty. $100 on Steam to whoever can do this with the derp nukem. Rules, save file, etc. all in the description like I said before. Before you get overzealous and try this, 
realized that this fight took four and a half hours, so the buzzards would respawn probably 15 times, which equates to 60 buzzards, and that's assuming you can hit the blimp as consistently as with the rocket speed nukem. So it's probably a lot more. Good. fucking Luck. The coward was the final thing I needed to take care of this run. His dumb dinosaur should have been fine with spud running strats, but I would randomly just blow myself up because my nukes hit some invisible wall, I guess. To combat this, I just made sure to poke out of my hole a little bit more, and it took about an hour to kill him. And it was time for the final fight in this hard drive filling godforsaken run. On the last run of our last money farm, we got our first pearl from the chest, which was pretty neat, and it would even come in handy. A few things stood out in this fight. First off, I don't recall his shock attacks looking this goofy. Probably a Phys X thing. Oh my god. How has the game not crashed yet? <laughs> Imagine if it crashed during the bl- You know what? I It's too soon. I can't think about that. I will die. Anyway. The other thing I noticed was Piston Shield starts rapidly recharging if you don't hurt him for like 6 seconds, which is not good considering it takes full ammo to break his shield. In order to combat this rapid recharge, I devised a strategy. When I would need to retreat to buy ammo, I would try to have him close to the barrier so that the nuke turret I threw put the fire dot on him, and then I would throw the other on the way back. This however was a tight window, and he often got most if not all of his shield back. A few heartbreaking attempts later, I was on the edge of victory, and the edge of bankruptcy. I had to make a sacrifice. The storm we got earlier would save the run and secure our win against Piston. Piston. Fuck you, Piston. Afterwards, we sold all the loot to buy the storm back, but sold too many items, and it wasn't in the buyback anymore. But after taking a victory lap, we got a different souvenir from this run. And I'm glad to say, you can beat Mr. Torg's Campaign of Carnage with only the Nukem. Before you go, I just want to say thank you so much for watching up to this point. If you want to support the channel, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Helps with YouTube's algorithm a lot, which helps the channel grow. If you want to support me more directly, consider becoming a channel member. 99 cents gets emotes and videos a day early, and the support helps me get videos out earlier for everybody. I'll link my Discord and my Twitch channel where I stream these runs live in the description. And last but not least, quick shout out to our homie Mango Soda, who made this video's thumbnail art. He does commissions, and he will also be linked down below. But until next time, Breathe easy, homies.